Hi, welcome to Ask GMBN Tech, the weekly question and answer session. Uh, if you've got anything tech you want to know about your mountain bike or maybe your friend's bike or this and that, get involved in the comments underneath. Use the hashtag Ask GMBN Tech and we'll do what we can to help you out. Uh, don't forget also, we've got a shop. We sell loads of cool hooded tops, riding gear, all sorts of stuff. There's always great deals to be had. Uh, please do support us and wear our kit. It's great seeing you out on the trails wearing it. Okay, first question this week then. Uh, this is a good old classic actually. So it's from Daniel Bowman and he says, if pedal threads are designed to not come loose whilst pedaling, why are bottom brackets the opposite? Okay, so what he means here is pedal threads, uh, if you're sat on the bike, both of your pedals will tighten towards the front of the bike. Uh, so that's a right hand thread for your right pedal and a left hand thread for your left pedal. Now it's not necessarily done to sort of tighten, it's more the fact, uh, in fact, if you skip all the way back to the years of the penny farthing, uh, it's kind of how we got here. Uh, it's a fixed wheel bike essentially, uh, but unlike a fixie that's got a chain and stuff, it's a direct drive. And due to the danger and the size of those bikes, if a pedal bearing was to lock up uh, and basically it would throw you over the handlebars, it would drive you headfirst into the floor. So the theory was, if you had a pedal that tightened towards the front of the bike, if the bearing was to lock up, it would automatically undo the pedal, so that would not happen. Now you can say for a bottom bracket, it's kind of the opposite. So a bottom bracket, when you sit on the bike, both cups will tighten to the rear. Uh, so that's a right hand thread or a clockwise thread for your left hand cup, and the opposite for your drive side cup. And the theory is, that the precession of the bearings, so precession is an effect essentially where something's moving one way and it moves the opposite way. Uh, the best example I can think of without getting too crazy with this is if I hold a pen in the middle here and you watch the end here, if I turn this end like a crank, you'll see that the other end goes the opposite way. Uh, it's essentially a similar concept to that. So the theory is the cups tighten into the, into the frame towards the back and the idea is that there's slight torque that's applied through the procession effect of the bearings as you're pedaling forwards, uh, so they won't come undone. It won't tighten them, but it will stop them coming undone. And the theory is, if the bearings seize up, then the cups will loosen in the frame rather than tightening in the frame. And now you've got to bear in mind that this kind of roughly how it works, but it's not always the case. Uh, in the road world, you get a thing called Italian threads. Uh, I'll tell you what, let's just not go there because it just overly complicates things, but that's the rough theory as to why your bottom bracket is threaded that way. Um, next question is from Steve Wenzel. Uh, Hi Dolly and Anna, I have a new old stock Yeti Arc hardtail XC race frame that I'd like to build up. The problem currently being a lack of 12 by 142 rear wheel sets available for MTB, especially here in Australia. I think Shimano do a micro spline hub this size, though I've not heard or seen anyone running this combo. Uh, Dolly briefly joked about a gravel bike wheel a few weeks ago on the show. Just wondering if the durability would be the main concern of this on an XC race bike. Any other thoughts? Um, do you know what? I can't remember the one I referred to, but I do know I did a video converting a bike with multiple chainrings to a one by, uh, and I actually kind of struggled to be honest doing that because one of the things in mountain biking compared to the road bike world is that we've had so many more standards change over the years, and I know it drives everyone mad, uh, it drives me posse as well. But let's face it, it is to try and improve things. It's just unfortunate the rate of which it happens. Now, one of the problems was the bike I was trying to turn, I think, into one by twelve from a two by ten. I'm going to guess at. Um, was the back end of the bike was a 135 quick release and I, was, I had a micro spine cassette and it was nearly impossible to find a wheel that suited and I managed to find one by DT. Now it was, I think it was a hybrid urban wheel uh, so it wasn't necessarily a road wheel so it was quite a strong wheel um, and it was fine and it accepted a micro spline so I fitted that to the bike and given the user intention of that style bike it was absolutely fine. Now I do know you have a few options this is just within DT, by the way, that I looked at, because they've got loads of options. Um, if you look on their website, you can click the options you want, the wheel size, uh, your axle width, and then it'll give you an option of the splines and the system that you want to run on there. Now, one of the things with DT Swiss is you get various different options at the back. You get the pull system and you get a ratchet system. Now, what you want to be looking for, unfortunately, uh, to convert a hub like that, like a 142 to microspline, will be a three-pool system. They do this adapter that you can see on screen and you can fit onto the three-pool hubs, basically. So you can find pretty much any that's a three-pool design within 142 and fit one of those to it and you should be in luck. Um, I'm sure there's loads of others out there. Has anyone else out there uh, struggled to find a wheel that sounds a little bit like the one that Steve's looking for. If you have, please let us know down there because it's always useful to know this stuff. Cross compatibility can be a nightmare with mountain bikes. Okay, moving on, on to Bujang. GCN just uploaded a video of a gravel bike with front suspension. How do you guys feel about it? 
Uh, next question, please. Nah, just joking. Uh, suspension on a gravel bike, yeah, front suspension actually makes far more of a difference than you might imagine. Now, despite the fact that most of the bias here ends up being around 30 millimeters, some people are scratching their head thinking, is it even worth it for the amount it costs, how much it weighs, and the look? Um, I say the look because I would say that the regular look of a gravel bike with a regular fork on there, none, a non-suspension fork, looks nicer, personally. I think a mountain bike style suspension fork and gravel bike kind of can be in danger of ruining the clean lines. However, they do work extremely well. And you will get some people say, oh, you can achieve this with a bigger front tire, run it softer. You can't. You can't achieve the control that you can get with a suspension fork on there. That's just a fact. Uh, they work extremely well. Would I have one? I don't know. I'm still kind of do my own sort of testing behind the scenes. And I actually really like that all bear I've got with a rigid fork on there. Um, and it nearly kills me riding thing, but I like it. Um, I think if I was you and I was even considering it, I definitely would. The one that I do have an issue with though, uh, I, and it's not really an issue, I just don't understand them. The full suspension gravel bikes. That is just something I really don't understand. If, if someone can see something I can't, I'd love to know. Um, I'm not being against them, I just don't get it personally. Uh, next up from Ian Davis. Why does the suspension on my short travel cross country bike feel more supple than the more expensive suspension on my trail bike? I spend much more time setting up the trail bike and it works great. But when I ride my cross country bike, it feels so active and effective. Right, so there's loads of things that contribute to this sort of feeling. And actually, I'm going to talk to you about a similar experience that I've had with mine. So on my Canyon Lux Trail, I've got the suspension units on it. It's got SID on the front and whatever the RockShox rear shock is. And by comparison, compared to, say, the Pike Ultimate and the equivalent shock that I've got on my Spectral 125, the damper units are far more simplified. Now this is partially the key to how they feel. Now the first thing that actually comes into account here is uh, the ride feel that you get from the setup. If you're running too much sag on your proper suspension as such, you know the bike with more travel and more advanced suspension units, then the shocks are going to be working overtime. Yeah, you're going to sat, you're going to be sat too deep in the travel, so it's going to feel overdamped. It's not going to feel reactive enough. Your bottom back bottom bracket position is going to feel a bit low. Your bottom bracket, um, of course, is like the fulcrum of the bike. So everything's just going to feel a bit off. Uh, so I do think that is something to do with it. However, there's a lot to be said for slightly more basic suspension, especially when there's less of it. And cross-country bikes, if you're running them with minimal compression and minimal rebound, you've got the correct sag on them. They can feel extremely fast and extremely active. And I've noticed that exact thing. Uh, whereas You've got to bear in mind, the more travel you have, the more damping you have to have in place to control that travel, whether it's in compression or rebound, uh, which is why I think something that might be affecting yours could be the sag. Uh, sag is something that actually a lot of people have wrong on their bikes. Even if it's just by like 5%, it can make a big difference. The more travel your bike has, the bigger difference it's going to make. If you have too much sag, it's going to feel wallowy. It's going to feel like a pig when you're trying to climb on the thing. Uh, likewise, if you have too little sag, you're not going to be using that travel. However, it can feel very nice with that. Uh, there we go. Moving on. Um, next question is from Matthew. I finally got around to updating my bike. Um, you haven't said what from, but I'm guessing something with older geometry, because you said I'm now on a Vitus with modern geometry. Since moving to this bike, I find it really hard to get a front wheel up for manuals, etc. How should I be setting the bike up? All right, so I'm just going to have to assume here that your previous bike was a much shorter bike and this Vitus you've got is something like an Escarpe, perhaps. Uh, my creator, guy behind the camera, actually Josh, he's got one of these, so I'm just liking it to that for this example. Now that bike is running around a 50 millimeter stem. It's got a nice long back end on it. It's got a nice long front end on it, like the front center of the bike. Now the longer the geometry of the bike gets, the longer the wheelbase is, the harder it's going to be to pick up the front end, especially when you're talking about your position on there. Now on a shorter bike, what your body weight does in relation to how close the wheels are together is more detrimental to the balance of the bike. The further you move forward, it's going to be easier to get the back end up and vice versa. Yeah, your body weight directly affects it. However, if you think of the modern geometry bike where the wheels are further apart and your body weight is near it in the middle of the two, the whole bike is more stable. So this is a great thing for off-road riding. Yeah, you're gonna equally weight your wheels much more often without having to move around too much. You're not gonna disturb the bike as such when you're riding. The downside is, as you're just discovering, a long chain stay that gives you loads of stability at the back is kind of difficult to lean back against. Uh, if anything, it weights that front end a bit more. Uh, and some people get obsessed with having a low front end. That further accentuates the weight on the front end 
brilliant for grip on the front wheel, not so good for getting your front end up. Uh, so the best thing you can do is experiment with spacers and your stem. You'll probably find with a new bike, you might have had one or two spacers there available to you. If they're not already under stem, get them under the stem. You want to try and raise your front end. There's also a chance, now I've ridden some Vitas bikes, so I've actually, the, the bike has come with a 50 mil stem and I've moved back to a 35 mil stem on there uh, because of the fact they've got a generous geometry on them and I found that's what I've needed to achieve uh, getting the front end up the way I like it. Um, high rise handlebars is the other option. So the height of the stem, the length of the stem and the rise of your bars are the three sort of major components here uh, to helping you get the front end up there. Uh, I run a 38 mil rise bar and between a 35 mil and a 50 mil stem depending on the bike that I'm riding on. Uh, in fact my new proof, uh, the Scout Hardtail that I've recently just been riding, I actually set it up with the stuff that I had on my previous reactor just like for like swapped it over pretty much uh, which included the 35 mil stem but because the reach and things are a little bit different um, I had to recalculate my position so I've gone for a 50 mil stem uh, just to return that position to get things feeling right so uh, you just need to play around with that stuff. Uh, once it feels about right and you're comfortable with it, stick with it and just commit to learning. You will adapt to the bike after a while. Um, hopefully that helps a little bit. Uh, next question is from 4130 Targe, 20-inch rider by chance, sound like one. Uh, my rear disc brake has pads that drag. I've bled the system twice, changed the fresh pads, reset the pistons, okay so you know what you're doing, and I've even bled the lever on its own. One side seems to drag more than the other. How can I sort this? Um, okay, so pads blow. So it sounds a little bit like you probably have sticky pistons. So if you think about a disc brake caliper, you've got the two parts of the caliper that are often bolted together. Within that, you've got your pistons and then you've got the brake pads. The pistons push the brake pads against the disc rotor. Obviously, the oil comes through the system into little ports behind those pistons and push them. Now the thing that enables those pistons to go in and out easily is the little seals that are around them. They look a little bit like O-rings but they're a bit more complicated than that. So these seals can dry up and if the pistons themselves get a bit dirty, they're not gonna move or retract back into place. Now those seals are the essential thing for making them retract back into place. So here's what you wanna do. Now this bit is vital. Depending on the model of brake you have, you need to use the same oil that's in the brakes to do this with. If your bike, for example, has Avid or SRAM brakes and it has dot fluid, then you use dot fluid for this. If your bike has Magura brakes, then you use Magura Royal Blood. If your bike has Shimano brakes, use the Shimano uh, brake fluid, okay? So stick with what it is that's already in your system. Remove your brake pads, remove your wheel from the bike, all that sort of stuff. Then very carefully squeeze your lever until those pistons come out and you'll see them. They're normally white in color, they might be dirty, uh, probably will be in your case. Now you don't want them to come out too far. Now I can't tell you how far to do it, you're gonna have to work this out yourself. Don't push them out all the way because they're gonna come out and it becomes a pain to get them back in as well as a full rebleed. Now you wanna push them out so you can expose enough of them that you basically think you can clean them with. And then using something like a cotton swab, get the relevant oil and clean the sides of them. Real clean them all the way around and then push them back into place. Retract them back into the housing. Use some isopropyl alcohol, disc brake cleaner, something like that to make sure there's nothing left on the disc brake caliper there. Uh, especially so if your bike has dot fluid because you don't want that to sort of take any paint off anywhere because it will do that if you leave it on the bike. Uh, clean it all, put your pads back in, give the lever a feel and hopefully they will retract and that won't be dragging. That's the usual culprit for that. Uh, you might find in doing this uh, that you've identified the need to bleed the system as well. If that's the case, pads out again, bleed block in, and bleed them in the relevant way. Uh, we've actually got a video on the channel. In fact, we've got loads of videos about brake bleed. I'm gonna throw them all down there for you. So hopefully something will be helpful for you. And the last question in this week's ask is from Jeff Blauvelt. Uh, Anna and Dottie, I was wondering what you guys think of titanium frames. Uh, are they as good as carbon or alloy for enduro and downhill? Any downsides compared to the more mainstream materials? Uh, well, if we go in reverse here, the downside with titanium straight out is it's expensive. So it's expensive to buy, it's expensive to work with uh, in every sense. It's difficult to cut, it's difficult to weld. Um, so it therefore becomes a premium material. Do we like it though? Well, I don't know about Anna, but I absolutely love titanium. There's something very special about the feel of a titanium frame, especially when it comes to rigid frames or hardtail frames. I actually had a frame made years back by Linsky, and it's still one of my favorite things, although I'm sad to say I've not ridden it for a long time. It's been almost abandoned with the sheer amount of bikes I'm lucky enough to be riding, but I'll never get rid of this thing. One of the best things about titanium is that it will never corrode. 
So you don't need to have paint on it or anything to finish it, you just have that raw titanium uh, look to the bike, which is, in my eyes, the best looking way you can have a titanium frame. And another really cool thing about titanium, it has a very unique ride quality. Now you'll hear this from titanium bike owners. Now it will be similar in some respects to what you can achieve with steel. Steel, certain, I don't know, something like 753 Reynolds Tubing has a nice springy nature to it. Uh, titanium kind of has that in a slightly more dead feeling, um, dampened feel. Really hard to describe. It's a nice, springy, resilient feel uh, that's somewhere in the middle of where you would be with a steel or an alloy. So uh, titanium obviously is an alloy. Uh, it's not pure titanium. You have to put mixtures of vanadium or alloy in it to make it better for use, otherwise it's too soft. Uh, but the material is incredible. It makes beautiful bikes. Uh, when it comes to full suspension bikes, jury's out. Is it any better than using steel? Do you lose some of the properties? Unsure. It's definitely harder to work with, so I guess that makes it more impressive when you see a titanium frame. Uh, this one on screen now is from Kingdom Bikes. I saw this, belongs to Greg, one of the guys from TF Tune. In fact, a couple of the guys, I think Paul's got one as well. Uh, beautiful looking bikes, really simple, and arguably, if you, correct, if you get the correct size for you and you get one that's got future-proof standards on it, could be the last bike you ever own. Uh, lovely bikes. Anyone out there got a titanium frame? Let us know in the comments underneath there, and if you like titanium, carbon, steel, uh, what's the best out of three and why? Please do let us know in the comments, and we'll see you on another, another see you on another ask soon. Ta-ra, take care.